Hi, Mira. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I want to ask just off the, the top how you're managing with pandemic related everything right now and, and how are you doing? Um, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, I'm very fortunate that nobody in my immediate family has the virus. We did have a relative that had it, but survived it just fine. Um, it was scary, but they got through it. Uh, and, um, we did lo lose my dear acting teacher, Gwen Hanman in New York to it, um, early on. And that was very tragic for me. Um, very sad. He was such a great, great man. And yeah, very important I'm... person in my formation as not only an actor, but as a human. Um, so yeah. a little shout out to Wynn in heaven. Um, yes, I'm so very sorry. Uh, thank you. But uh, I, I think these days I'm a little bit more frightened of it. Like I just, I, I, every day, you know, I shouldn't, but I'll open up the news on my phone and be like, ah, the numbers in California keep growing and growing, you know, and uh, LA County, you know, it's just one of the hot spots in the world right now. Yeah. And, you know, it's sort of crazy because I think California did a really good job early on in containing it, but I think we reopened way too soon and, and everybody was just like, it's fine now, you know, things are reopening. So it's fine that the, the threat is passed. And I remember, um, you know, live in a rather small community within the county and we took a COVID test like maybe a month and a half ago just just to see to make sure that we were all fine and the doctor there said that just in the past two days she had had to make 30 she had to call 30 people to get, tell them they were positive and this was at a time that people were like oh I don't know anybody who has it nobody has it we're, all, we're fine here this is kind of sleepy here and it's just growing up and up and up and up so uh i i am frightened of it but you know I'm sure yeah we all are. i i think so and it's hard to know what the right thing to do is because sometimes it's it's like oh is this a backlog of tests and now it's coming out or what what is what is happening so i think the best we can do is is be safe ourselves and and with the people that are closest to us yes yes and, and to just cherish cherish the time that we have with them and try and turn something very hard and negative into a positive by building, you know, building at least these memories that we wouldn't have with each other, you know, in this, in this time, because we're usually so busy. Like just my kids, you know, we have four kids and usually um, my daughter's a very serious dancer and she takes like nine classes a week outside of school, as well as being on the dance team at her high school. And so she's always over, you know, in her classes and we're driving her there and then my sons are super ardent baseball players very very serious and they're either playing with the team or working out with a coach or working out with my husband and um so so often we can't even eat at home because dinner time we're near where the lessons are and it's already <laughs> 8 p.m so there's no way to go home and cook now we eat three meals a day at home <laughs> Four seven cooking at home, cooking at home because we're even afraid of takeout. I mean, we're just nervous Nellies, you know. So, um, so we just make everything at home all the time, and we have all these family dinners together and family lunches, and we uh, we bought this picnic table and set it up with all these kind of fairy lights around it, mm. and uh, we made this little grove area where we come and have a lot of dinners outside, and you know, it just. Uh, We've been trying to just celebrate the togetherness. Yeah, that's funny. I we we do the same thing, and and we put lights out on our back porch, and and it's very hot up here right now in the nineties. So, and have my grandmother over for dinners and do it safely. And it's I I'm finding through the the drama and the sadness of a lot of this is a certain ability to find and maintain connections that maybe you didn't quite hold on to tight enough before. Yeah. I, I hope that's what we can take from it. Yeah. Yeah. And that all we have is the here and now and that the most important thing is the love and safety and, you know, wellness of the people we love, not, not our achievements out in the world, you know, and like, all of that has fallen away. Like the achievements have fallen away. Yes. It's all about the 
the core group and and you know I was like you know what I, I like I just as long as I have my children and my family with me and they're safe then I'm fine you know yeah so. yeah exactly so I want to kind of go into the Wayback Machine a little bit, and I just normally, as as a crazy person that I am, I watch you know Oscar speeches and all of these shows all the time, just on repeat. So of course I I rewatched your your Oscar winning speech, which I adore. And speaking of, you know, family and family connections, I mean, one of the best parts about that is your dad's reaction. And I, I don't think there's just a, a more beautiful moment of parent-child pride and, and happiness. And do you think about that moment much or remember that moment very well? Oh, I definitely, <laughs> like, I definitely, I mean, you can't forget can't forget an Oscar moment like you know when it happens to you like that you can't forget what the feeling when they call your name and then when you're standing there up on stage and trying to get out what you want to get out um, and I definitely always thought that if if I won I would have to kind of share it with dad because I felt that he really did from the time I was eight years old you know coach me and devote out like I can't even count the amount of hours that he spent with me as a child and a teenager teaching me how to act. Um, and, you know, I, as I said, I did have later acting teachers such as Bill Esper, the late Bill Esper or um, Wynn. And, and that, that's my one regret is that I forgot to mention Wynn in my Oscar speech. And I've always felt bad about that. Um, and I believe I mentioned him backstage in some of the interviews, but I didn't, mm -hmm. there, but I, yeah. I it's always on me. Um, but, uh, but to be able to share it with dad, because dad has never been nominated. And my father is a great actor. I mean, he really is a truly great actor. And I've heard, you know, some of the greatest actors in, in the industry say it to him that they think of him as one of the greatest actors of all time. So among his peers, he is venerated and respected, but for some reason, it just has never translated into an Oscar nomination. Um, so I just wanted to share it with him because I felt like it was as much his as mine. It was. It was, it was just such a moment. Yeah. It was beautiful. So, but there was also this crazy feeling like when I stepped onto the stage and I started talking, there was this wave of love that I felt from the audience. And not only I felt it was too big for just the audience in the room, like it felt like the, the television audience. Like, and I'm not, I'm not a new agey crystal-y kind of person. I love crystals, but I don't really think of them as having powers. I just like the way they look. But, you know, they... It, it just like this positive wave like swept over me all of this goodwill and um, it was really quite extraordinary and I'd never really felt anything like that before or since I mean it was just like wow like I could feel just all these positive feelings of love coming through the air um, and uh, you know definitely you know he and I had that moment of shared love so for all the ways <laughs> it was it was wonderful I know you were really young at the time but what did, what did you think an Oscar win meant and, and meant for your career? What, what did you think of just in the, the following period after that? Uh, I definitely changed my career, definitely. Whereas before I was largely an unknown, you know, before the nomination, before, you know, that fall. Um, it, you know, all of a sudden I was in conversations for larger, projects than I would have been able to be considered for before, um, you know, director meetings, uh, offers, like it was just a different, different ballgame. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would be impossible not to talk a little bit about Romy and Michelle, if that is okay, because <laughs> I, I do not hesitate to put it on an all time favorite list for me because it is so repeatably watchable it's so funny and one of the things that I've noticed in in your career is is how you change and modulate your voice all the time like in Mighty Aphrodite it's that ah, and it's really high-pitched in Romeo and Michelle it's really low and I I, I want to know what what your what your process is for 
deciding on how to get to the right voice of a character. And then, of course, I'd like to spend the next four hours talking about Romy and Michelle. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, well, I, I read the script over and over first, and I start hearing the voice of the character in my head sometimes. Um, in some cases, I'll workshop it, I'll try different things out, I'll take notes. But a lot of times it's just kind of instinctual because each character speaks as their own separate person. Um, you know, I, I try never to repeat myself to never play the same person twice. I mean, they're all extensions of me somehow, you know, they're all living inside of me. It's like I've got a bunch of <laughs> crazy people inside of me. Um, but, uh, but based on their heart and their persona, they talk in a certain way based on where they come from, their socioeconomic background, the street that they live on, their ethnicity, that all informs how they speak. So if, if it is a person from a place, like when I did Summer of Sam, yeah. um, I interviewed girls from the Bronx um, and found the, you know, the exact Italian American from the Bronx girl that I wanted to base the voice on. Um, even though I'm Italian American, I'm half Italian American, but I'm from New Jersey and my parents spoke like newscasters. So <laughs> I, I, I didn't have any regionality to their speech. Um, I feel like as an adult, once I moved to New York, I actually picked up more of a New York tonality to my own voice, which I always have to be vigilant about when I'm playing like middle American characters or, you know, when I have someone with a big accent, like a British accent or, you know, a Southern accent, then, then I don't have to worry about that because that masks it. But when I'm playing someone who's not supposed to have any regionality or is supposed to be more Northwestern or whatever, I always have to be aware of that little New Yorkiness that comes into my voice. Um, but um, yeah, so, so I'll find a person, like when I did Barcelona, I, you know, Whit Stillman, Whit Stillman liked the way his wife spoke and wanted us girls to kind of pattern ourselves on her accent. Um, so I recorded her. And the, the way I do, like, you know, when I'm doing seriously intensive accent work, as opposed to just picking a voice, you know, um, I will have conversations with them, record them, and then I'll also sometimes have them record some of my monologues or some of my dialogue. And then sometimes I'll have them sentence by sentence with, with a big space in between. And I'll listen to them say the, the, the line, but they won't act it, they'll just read it monotone, right? Um, and then I will say the line afterwards and I'll keep re-recording myself until my version of it sounds like theirs. And it's very labor intensive, you have to work on it quite a lot. And, but the point is at the end to be able to do any dialogue or even improvisation without flaw in that accent and in that voice. And whether it's the accent or whether it's just the character voice, you have to be able to improv in it. And that was sort of one of the things that um, when Hanman talks, you know, he had this, this wonderful uh, concept called the character interview where halfway through your work on a piece and a character, you'd walk in the stage, there'd be like a little spotlight on a chair, you'd sit there and he'd say, hello and to you and your character, hello, Romy, or you know, hello, Judy, or hello, whomever. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. And then he'd ask you specific questions and you'd have to be ready to respond about anything pertaining to her life or the story in character, in the voice. So in order to be really there, really ready to give a full performance that is really alive and not intellectual, not where you're planning it and thinking it, but you're actually just in it, you have to have done all that work so that you can be free. Um, so you can just sort of go into it at any point and you have to know everything about her, what sort of pushes her buttons, um, you know, in a strong way and what circumstances she came from and what kind of formed her and what she really wants and what she cares about, what her vulnerabilities are. And you have to be able to do it all in that, in that seamless, now natural instinctual voice and, and accent. So it's, it's a lot of work, but it's fun. I really enjoy it. It's part of the fun of my craft. No, it has to be. And it's like I said, it's one of the things that I think is that I that I think about when I when I think of you is that you you do feel different all the time because you are so careful and selective about who your character is. And I, I think it's been really impressive. Okay. Uh, talking a little bit about Romeo and Michelle, I, I know 
that, that, that you and Lisa Kutra have both talked about potentially reviving or finding a way to, to bring it back. Uh, what, what would that look like? What would you want it to look like? I mean, for me, I would be really happy with it to be either a film or, or a TV series because I am now much more open to TV than I was in the past because I see having been in some great TV, yeah. what potential for it is, you know, whether it was Hollywood or Modern Family or, you know, just getting to, to explore a character through multiple episodes, through an arc, is actually super fun and interesting. And, you know, the confines of a film are sort of perfect. You know, mm. things perfectly crafted and there's beginning, middle and end. But there's a lot of fun to be had in, in seeing where you're going to go and growing as the, as the show evolves. Um, so I'd be open to either of those. I do feel like we'd have to, you know, find ourselves in some ridiculous situation again. I'm sure, well, I, I'm not sure. I think we would have been together all this time, but maybe we've grown apart and we've come back together and, you know, we're thrown back together by life again in some way. Maybe mm. we're quarantining together. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe she invites me over to Sandy Frank's mansion and we're staying there. I feel like there'd need to be a young character, like a teenage girl, boy, I don't know, trans character. I don't know. There'd have to be some younger generation character that brings in that generation that our show was really about in the first place and people didn't understand that. Like, yeah. I felt like there, that was the one flaw of the design of how Romeo Michelle was originally put out. Like, I think it was thought to be a movie for people like who were like 28 or 30, you know, going to their high school reunion. But our characters were really mentally, emotionally, psychologically the age that they were in school. They never evolved, right? They're still perhaps 14, not even 16. You know, mm -hmm. they're just <laughs> kids. And young people have always super loved this story. And yeah. so I feel like it would be remiss to make it like just for older characters. Like I think we'd have to have, like I, I, I sort of had this idea that Romy would somehow have kind of inherited a, a niece or something uh you know like she's somehow she's somehow now the guardian of someone young and uh, you perhaps dangerous and you know <laughs> and very uh, very unprepared for it <laughs> yeah, very unprepared she's not like the super mom you know she, she, she didn't expect this she's not a particularly feminine nurturing person so you know <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, but she'd have to become, you know, in her own odd way. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that there could be so much fun, um, you know, and, you know, Romy and Michelle run for president, Romy and Michelle quarantine together, Romy and Michelle, you know, go to the moon. I don't know, Mars, perhaps. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to get my pen and paper and I'm going to start writing now. <laughs> yeah, the sky's the limit. I think, I think, you know, Lisa and I still really love each other. We, we've been talking a lot over these past few months and it's been okay. really wonderful to, to be connected to her. She's such, she's such an incredible person. Lisa Kudrow is an incredible person. She's yeah. a wonderful woman, like yeah. unbelievable person, like just so smart, so funny, very, very wise, a good, good person. So. Um, well, I, I, that's, yeah, I love that. I, th I think, I think uh, a lot of people would be pretty into that. So let's, let's cross some fingers and see. Uh, you mentioned other TV work and human trafficking, I think was a really big, seemed like a very big point in your career and your life because it also inspired a great deal of activism on your part and you became a U.S. ambassador. Obviously, the, the show is what inspired you to do that, but what was, how, how did you know that you had to, you had to act and you had to do this? Um, it was sort of a, a kind of commingling of timing because we had, um, so I had become um, Amnesty, Inter Amnesty International Stop Violence Against Women campaign spokesperson in 2004. While I was with them, I discovered the scourge of modern day slavery, which is human trafficking, and that you know, there are currently 30 million people living as slaves in the world today, more than any, any other point in, in recorded human history. Um, and I was shocked because I had thought slavery had you know, gone the way of, you know, the Civil War and, you know, the, although we still have a kind of modern slavery in the prison system, that legal slavery having been abolished was the end of slavery. It's not true. It just went underground. 
just became this highly profitable criminal enterprise that's hidden from view and very difficult to detect and the survivors and victims of it are are largely voiceless because they're from marginalized communities around the world. Um, so I had already learned about him trafficking when I was offered the script and I showed this, the miniseries script to my bosses at Amnesty and they read it and vetted it and said that it was very accurate and not exploitive, you know, because obviously you do a story about sex trafficking of young girls. It could be very sleazy. You know, it could, it could pander to the baser instincts, mm -hmm. but actually it was very respectful and, and accurate. And, um, and so I, I was excited to do something that kind of married my art and my activist interests. And in doing so, I learned a lot more about it. Yeah. Um, you know, while I was doing it, I interviewed law enforcement agents to play my role. But after, when we were promoting the story and we were also involved in trying to get some uh, legislation repassed in DC, it was the Trafficking, Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and we were trying to beef it up and add something about mail order brides. And um, I asked if I could speak to some trafficking survivors. And I went to a group called CAST, which is the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking in Los Angeles. And I met with two women who had been trafficked and their stories blew me away. Yeah. And as I looked into their eyes, I had never seen such pain in a human being, except for someone who had survived the Holocaust. Like they had this sort of excoriated look, like that the people could treat them in such a fashion was just, just beyond, you know, it, it was it was really testing to my understanding of human nature, um, just as the Holocaust or any genocide is. When you see how bad humans can be to other humans, it's it's really, it, it it's hard to comprehend. But it is out there. This is, you know, and and the thing is that, you know, all of my life I've been very motivated to look at issues of prejudice and oppression, racism, genocide. The crazy part, anything that makes a person an other, you know, that otherizes the person, makes them less than, makes them somebody, you know, that you can abuse because you see them as less than yourself or your group. The crazy thing about human trafficking is it does that to its victims, but it's only for money. It's not really about a deeply held prejudice towards those people. It's because the traffickers see them as a means to profit, as a, as a mode of making themselves enriched and they do not have any humanity. They do not care about the humanity of these people. They can do it to their own children. It doesn't have to even be another group. Um, so it's really something about human nature, which is really tremendously awful to look at. Yeah. Um, but once I, yes, once I met these two women, it changed my life. It changed the course of my life. So I became much more invested in the fight against human trafficking. I have since um, you know, in 2009, uh, I was asked to become the Goodwill Ambassador at the United Nations on Human Trafficking for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And uh, I am still doing that to this day. I'm going to be hosting an event, a virtual event, on July 31st for the Worldwide Day Against Human Trafficking for the UN. Um, so, you know, the fight continues. It's really awful because so little is actually done. You know, there are so few convictions worldwide maybe 50,000 to date of traffickers and 30 million people living as slaves. Yeah. Right now, only 1% of trafficking victims has the chance of being discovered and rescued, 1%. And, um, you know, in a week's time, and these figures may not be fresh, but they're recent, uh, we spend, in, in a few hours, the United States spends more on the war on drugs than it does in any of our domestic and international programs combined against human trafficking. And yet human trafficking is tied for second place of the world's most profitable criminal enterprises. It's $250 billion a year. And drugs is always slightly above it, but not by that much. Yeah. And the fact that our attention should be so thoroughly, you know, weighted on stopping the contraband illegal substances from being traded rather than the human beings whose lives are being destroyed. It's a mystery to me. Uh, but so think they're a mystery to me these days. So. Yes, but, exactly. yeah, the people that I met galvanized me. That is, yeah. that is, and I continue to interview them. I've, I've interviewed probably almost a hundred trafficking survivors over the years and even interviewed a, a human trafficker in Spain. Um, it was very, very eye-opening. How has that experience and and talking to these people informed 
what your career looked like after that and the choices that you made was were, were there really distinct moments where you thought i can't do this or this doesn't feel right but maybe you wouldn't have thought that before yeah well i think you know i did i have involved myself in several trafficking related projects since then you know i did a movie uh called trait of innocence which was a fictional um, depiction of a uh, sort of events that were inspired by IJM, the International Justice Mission in Cambodia, but we shot it in Thailand. Um, I had the great good fortune of connecting there with the UNODC office for the region there, and I learned so much more about the problem overseas in mm. Southeast Asia. Really crazy because there's so much of a pedophile market over there um, that both local men and foreign tourists, foreign sex tourists, really avail themselves of and abuse children horribly. And then a few years later, I did the CN Freedom Project every day in Cambodia, which was a you know documentary, which I was the host of on the ground, yeah. um, exploring child sex trafficking there. And it's just very heartbreaking. But the the uh, the group that we focused on there, Agape International Admissions AIM, has done a tremendous job fighting it within that community of uh, Swai Pak in, in Phnom Penh. They've now built a school that can take people from pre-K to master's degree within this poorest of the poor community where there was almost a 100% rate of trafficking for children. Like every child would be trafficked when they came of a certain age, between eight and 12. Like it was crazy. And uh, they're transforming the community. They work hand in hand with the government. They have a SWAT team to conduct finally successful raids. They always used to be tipped off. Um, they have a gym where they get young hoods who used to be traffickers to become instead like champion Muay Thai fighters for the country in a, in a registered boxing gym that's on television every weekend. And these former traffickers who used to traffic like little kids in their community are now ardent abolitionists. It's, it's really an incredible group, like they're amazing. And we felt there's some on their work at that point and they've done so much more since then. But you know, so those are points of light where you see people actually making change and saving thousands of lives and, and, yeah. and changing the heart of a community to being one that no longer tolerates the trafficking of their young because the, the reason it becomes an endemic problem is because it becomes the sort of status quo. Well, everybody does it. You know, we're starving. We have to sell our kids. You know, Joe, my neighbor does it. What else am I to do? I owe $5,000 to the loan shark. They won't kill us if we give them our 12 year old daughter. What else am I going to do? And they're kind of getting people to change their attitudes and giving them the means to pull themselves up and giving the parents jobs so the kids don't have to work on their backs, giving the kids educations to pull themselves out of poverty. It's yeah, but it's, you know, like in the U S I mean, we have so much, we have so much both labor trafficking and sex trafficking, but most of our sex trafficking victims are not foreign. Most of them are U S kids from the foster system. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, homeless kids, trans kids are propositioned within like 24 hours of being away from home. Um, you know, people who come from abusive homes and it's all fed by a demand for commercial sex where people, you know, people want to buy it. So traffickers have something to sell to them, you know, and it's all online. And it's very, uh, so yeah, I try not to do anything that's exploitive, that's glamorizing, you know, the exploitation of people. Like if something to me feels like kind of sick and um, sadistic, I try not to do anything that's sadistic towards women or children, you know, yeah. like, uh, over the years, I've turned down things based on based on those criteria, even before I worked on, you know, like I think when I was a young actress, I was offered a role in which I would play a girl who's killed in like a sort of a snuff film type of thing. And I was like, yeah. I can't, I don't want to do that. It's too ugly. I can't, can't be part of that. Yeah. You know, it's a big director, big deal. You know? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so I don't know, but we try, you know, we try with the, with our lives to sort of affect the balance of the positive, but we really don't know. Sometimes we make mistakes and, you know, well, I mean, I, I, I applaud that you have sh shined a light on something that largely was ignored and the, that the world community was not giving much time and, and participation to. So it's, uh, you know, it's every little bit helps, but you've done a tremendous amount. So I, I absolutely applaud that. Thank you. And shifting gears just a little or a lot, I guess, um, I really want to talk about Hollywood for you, Hollywood being the Netflix series. Um, this is really unlike anything that's ever been on television. 
It's a wonderful reimagining of what things could have been had the systemic issues of homophobia and racism and misogyny not really been in place. And yeah. you play a fantastic actress named Jean Crandall. And I, I want to know what excited you the most at first about this and, and, and taking this part. Oh, I, you know, I think that the, the sort of, I was told about it. I said, you know, there's a Ryan Murphy project. There's a role that sort of like a Lana Turner type. It's about, you know, old Hollywood. And I was like, so <laughs> like, that's, all, that's, that's all I need to hear. And that's all I did know. I didn't get a script before I said yes. Just said, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> I love it. That that's like your that's like your scene with with Holland Taylor and and Patty Pone, and you're like, yes, I'll take it. <laughs> I actually don't know who she is. <laughs> yeah, right, right. That was yeah, yeah. That, I, I love yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, you know, I, I, honestly, you know, Ryan Ryan Murphy has built such an empire of incredible television work. I mean, really, you know, I, I know last year he was on the cover of is it Time as the King of Television? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, you know, he really has done extraordinary stuff, extraordinary, and, uh, um, you know, in so many varied genres, and uh, my personal favorite, I think, before Hollywood was Pose. I just love Pose. I love the heart in it. I love the, you know, sort of found family aspect of it, the, the sort of hidden community, the hidden struggles, you know, the, yeah. the attacking world of living in the time of AIDS, and all of that transphobia, and, uh, rejection from families, but then these new families that just, there's so much beauty in that show. There's so much beauty. Like it, it's heartbreaking for me. Like when Billy Porter sings to his dying boyfriend in the, in the first episode, oh my, in the first season, he just, ah, he just, yeah. ah. Um, but uh, so I think Hollywood has similar heart, but it's more lighthearted. You know, there's something, a, a, there is a, a romp feeling to it, mm -hmm. an unexpected surprising romp to it, but then it does get a little bit more serious as it goes along. And for me, what is fantastic about it is that it does have happy endings, but they're not, they're earned happy endings. They're not twist to fate happy endings. They're not like, oh, all of a sudden the princess says the magic word and the castle doors <laughs> open. Prince marries her and she's swept off into the sunset. Everybody who has a happy ending in the story achieves it through being honest and truthful and brave come what may yeah. all of them and yeah. all of them with their own internal truth and they're brave and they do the hard thing and even jean who, you know on the surface you'd say oh she's sort of a, a batty blonde you know she's a you know she's she's sort of a you know you would think that she's kind of self-centered and but she actually cares a lot about all the other young actors around her. She cares a lot about the Camille character, you know, uh, or Harry's character, the young Harrier, or the, the young black actress who's uh, really being kept down in this limited stereotypical view of what she can play, even though she could play anything. She's yeah. being made to play a maid. And then not only is there the indignity of being made to play a maid, but she is being directed to do it in a caricatural way. And you see her in the first scene, with her, my character, where I, I give her like a little, you know, yeah, nice adjustment. But it's like a fellow feeling of like, I, I see you, I know what you're going through, you know, hang in there, kid. And then the second time we see them working on that same project with the same director, I actually actively stand up for her and the director screams at me for it, you know, but, but you know, Jean actually has this, you know, this, this compass in her about what is fair and she sees the other young people going through what, indignity she had go in her own way because she's a woman um and uh it, just like in the rock hudson scene you know when he has his screen test and she's the off-camera reader and although although there's that part of gene that's like what about me look at me <laughs> yeah. and she's, you know she does this whole thing and, and, and some of that and falling from your <laughs> and that was all improv because that wasn't originally in there like I love it I just had lines, you know, I was just supposed to read the off camera lines and then comment to him a few times. And then, yeah. and then <laughs> Janet came out to me and she was like, 
whatever you're doing there, keep doing it. We're dying over by the monitor. We're cracking up. Okay, yeah. keep throwing it at us. Come on. So like, I was like, but this is a Hollywood sign. I'm, I'm just going to climb on top of it. And, you know, to, all right. <laughs> and like, she's just, you know, she's just hamming it up. But at the same time, her heart starts to break for this poor kid who's just spectacularly blowing it. Yeah. And she hates Henry Wilson. She knows he's a predator. She knows he's a scumbag. And he walks off. You can see him walk off on, on young Robinson. And, yeah. and she's seen him whispering in his ear anyway, so she knows the kind of Svengali strange attention that he's paying to him and is probably pretty sure what's happening behind closed doors. You know, he was such a, a predator. Um, and at the end of it, she's so kind to him. You know, she goes up to him and she's like, you know, it's all right. You got it. We all, we've all been there. You know, how <laughs> it came out of the end, you know, and she's, she's really kind of kind to him and so we see that she has a good heart and then we see that she's having sex with Rob Reiner's character which I didn't know until I got to that episode I had no idea <laughs> okay and, yeah um and uh and I was like oh wow are people going to conflate me with character because mm -hmm. you know he, he seems like a sort of a Harvey yes. person except he's not he, I don't think he's a predator I think he's just a man enjoying his you know, drugs spoils. And right. He he's the king, and he gets to have whatever women he wants. In in my character story, she's in a consensual ten year affair where yes. they do genuinely seem to have affection for each other. And you know, when we played it, Janet was also encouraging it. No, that there's affection for sure. And I was very relieved about that because I I like the idea that they're almost like an old couple. You know, it's sort of mm -hmm. you know there is something between them, um, but she comes clean, you know, she actually admits to, to Patty LuPone, the great Patty LuPone, uh, yes, I've been having an affair with your husband and I was involved in his unfortunate incident. <laughs> and she's ready to give it all up. She's, she's ready to resign because she's had this crisis of her conscience and she doesn't want to live this way anymore. And, uh, and she admits that she felt trapped that he could, you know, kick her out forever from the movie system if she broke it off with him. Um, and then so unexpectedly, not only is she forgiven in that episode, but in the next one, you have Holland and Patty, Holland Taylor and Patty, giving my character this incredible opportunity to play this true character role where people will finally see her medal as an actress and see what yeah. she has in her heart and her craft. And uh, she's sort of blown away by it. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, so, so I was like, okay, well, I think everyone knows that the reason I was black is because I turned Harvey down on multiple occasions. Yeah. So I did not go down that path of a consensual or even non-consensual relationship. There was no relationship, but, but in the same way, I think they're both, they, she and I, were the victims yeah. of a system in which yes. um, moguls of great power felt that they were above the law and could abuse the women and men who were underlings to them and, and sort of, play chess with their lives and uh and i think that ryan was very aware of that and wanted to depict that not only with my character but with the rock hudson character and i think there's a fantastic scene in the last episode where rock and henry wilson have a meal together and henry is trying to achieve absolution he's trying to apologize and say i'm not a bad man i'm in therapy i'm not going to do this anymore can you forgive me and rock is like forgive you I have nightmares about you. Like, I don't think I can forgive you. And I thought that was really powerful because like we see that it was not nothing. It was not just, okay, quid pro quo. Well, everybody's happy. And although I do like the fact that he tries to make reparations, he tries to make a movie vehicle for rock to make things right. Yeah. And I don't think we've seen Hollywood do that yet for Harvey's 200 plus survivors. I mean, I think it'd be great if there was some sort of like reparatory justice, conciliatory justice. Yeah. You know, like, um, but, but it doesn't change the fact that he was a rapist and a, and a sinister predator. Um, so, but all of them, you know, my character included, because she's honest, because she's a good egg, because she's willing to risk everything for being truthful, you know, because Holland and Patty listen to their North Stars in their heart and decide to cast people of color, decide to be representational, decide to greenlight a movie about Dreamland and, and the, the open gay couples. Uh, Dick Samuel is living as an openly gay man. Yeah. You know, everything 
the, the, the casting the anime Wong and giving her that second chance that she didn't have in life. You know, her career was robbed from her um, as an Asian American woman. It was, I, I mean, like everyone has the happy ending they deserve because of their, their choices and their bravery. And I think that's what's really extraordinary about this piece. And I think it is a bellwether for how people should behave because there's no time like the present to start living an authentic life. Yeah, and I, I, I think, I think you nailed it. I, I think you absolutely nailed that. And, and it's, it's the, the thing that is the most fascinating to me that you are cast in this role. And Jean Crandall is constantly doing the right thing that she's supposed to do. And she is rewarded because of it. And good things happen to her. And I feel like that's, you stood up and you said what you needed to say and spoke your truth. And now you have this. And there is a wonderful symmetry to that. And it's, it's great because in the show, it's a fictional situation. And, and then in real life is, is your situation. And they sit side by side in a way that, that makes you the ideal person for Gene Crandall. It's, it's the thing I think that really, I hope people think about when they're watching it, that, that there is, there's a lot of really good subtext to, to what they're seeing. I think that that one scene in the commissary with Paul and Patty, I, 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 think, I think if they know anything about my life, I think people will start drawing comparisons. Um, but I think just, you know, because in that moment when, the, you know, when I say, you know, like I can't, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing now, but because now I'm getting all misty, uh, you know, but like that, that, that you should be able to see me and what I might be capable of doing and, and her gratitude to these women like it's a sisterhood, you know? Um, and uh, I was extremely moved when I played the scene. And I think that that was a very authentic moment. It was real life and screen life converging. And I thank, I thank Ryan and Ian and, you know, all the, all the creatives on the show for creating that moment because I think it was a moment of healing, you know, um, a moment of vindication for a lot of people who've, who suffered and who feel like, you know, there is hope and forward movement possible, you know? And I think this was a moment where it was like creating the meritocracy that should be. And the only way to create it is by extending and taking those risks and being like, let's make the choice that, that wasn't made before. Yes. You know, let's, let's be, let's be rewarding people for what, what they can do and not, uh, you know, not any other reason. It's, it's, it was really wonderful to, to see scenes, the, the two scenes you're, you're talking about, the first one with Patty Lapone and then the second with her and Holland Taylor, of women lifting each other up together instead of creating a competitive nature in which they are putting you out to pasture or just out of of anything yeah. and that is not something that we get to see very much and uh, again like so much of of the show was such a, a welcome thing to see yeah i mean I, you know i think i think maybe we've seen enough darkness 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 i think maybe we've seen enough of like ooh, the edgy dark choice is always the better one in a show let's make everything brutal and hopeless and cynical it's like well how can we live if that's all that we're feeding off of you know i mean we've explored that that the bellwether you know it's, it's like the pendulums you know we've done so much dark content yeah and and it's fascinating and strong but maybe there was a reason that those old hollywood movies were so beloved because it gave people hope. And I think that this one is like an informed hope. You know, this yeah. one is a realistic hope. You know, it's just like, we actually have the power to be this way. You know, yeah. we've started being this way to some extent. Let, let's continue on that path. Like we, we can achieve this sort of utopia. We, we're halfway there now. They weren't there at all then, but we can be that now. It's not actually that hard, you know? Yeah. So, so that, I think that's beautiful. I think we need a little beauty in our lives, especially right now. 
I, I couldn't agree more. I absolutely agree. You mentioned uh, Lana Turner as, as a sort of model for Jean Crandall. Were there other women that you were kind of pulling from or what was your, your inspiration? Um, well, because they mentioned Lana Turner, I started reading everything I got her. I read her autobiography, I read her daughter's book. I bought a book that was written by one of her ex-husbands, but it was really smutty and very derogatory character. So I kind of breezed through that quickly. Yeah. Um, I watched a lot of her movies. Uh, I came to realize that I felt that Jean and she are not the same because Jean is not as strong and sort of iron-sided as Lana. Lana mm -hmm. was the ultimate Hollywood survivor. Like, Scandals seem to bounce off of her. I mean, she married so many times and had many scandals, like crazy things happen, crazy yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and her daughter, you know, killed her lover. If we, if we were to believe that, perhaps it was Lana who killed her. Yeah. We don't know, we don't know, yeah. you know. Uh, but, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it came out later that her daughter had been being, uh, assaulted by uh, one of her ex-husbands yeah. um you know so she was she was an abused child a sexually abused child um but i think there was a strength to lana and a steel and an ambition that went way beyond what gene is capable of gene is ultimately softer than lana yeah. gene is not the ice queen villainess like you know the most important thing was you know like, like the crazy part is when she talked about imitation of life in her autobiography, she didn't even mention the woman who played the black friend nanny character in it, yeah. who was so extraordinary in it. The, the, I think her name was Juanita. I'm, I'm trying to remember her last name. Yeah, Juanita Moore. Yeah, she was incredible. And yeah. I thought her performance stole the show. Yes. And and Lana in her autobiography doesn't even mention her. She instead talks about how she was so upset about something in real life. And then in the scene of the funeral, hmm. she was thinking about that and she broke on camera and it was the perfect moment of her bringing her real life emotions to play. She doesn't even talk about the greatness of this woman's performance. I mean, she was clearly jealous of it or something, you know? Yeah. So I, I do think that there was a kind of a, you know, me, 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 yeah. the, show, the show, everything must go on, the great Lana Turner. And that's not Jean at all. You know, Jean is softer than that and kinder and, and not as good at, at riding those waves. You know, I, I think uh, Lana, I don't think Lana ever had a known relationship with one of these powerful men. She would instead like align herself with other, other men to kind of keep herself out of the, I think, out of the pool of dating, but somehow managed to keep entrancing everyone. Yeah. Um, keep, keep herself, I think she made choices that were very politic and, um, my daughter's at the door. Hi, honey. Hi. <laughs> Get here, sweetie. It's okay. Sorry. No. I think she uh, woke up from a nap and was upset uh, that we weren't in the main house. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, so, but I didn't really use anybody else because I already knew a lot about the era having portrayed Marilyn Monroe. Yes. And, uh, and having, you know, watched and studied a fair bit about old Hollywood. But in the books about Lana Turner, there were just things about the studio system. She wrote that there were these studio contract girls who would be hired by the studio with the express purpose. They were just there as like fresh fodder for all the executives and directors and the powerful men to date and use and abuse. And then after their contract was up, they'd be kicked out. And there was never really a plan for them to actually be taken seriously as actresses. Mm -hmm. They were just there as fresh meat to be slept with. And that is truly awful, you know? And think about all of those young hopefuls that would come out to LA hoping to be actresses. Yeah. And they thought they'd had their big break when actually they were just in a sort of uh, concubine system. Yeah, which it, in itself was, was like a sex trafficking scheme. Yeah. 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 Do you, so, you, me you mentioned the, the screen test episode, uh, which is a really, really great episode. And, and, <laughs> and working with, with Jake Picking as, 
as Rock Hudson. Did you find with, with the cast that is in this movie, which is, has a lot of young and, and new talent, that, that you were kind of that person, a little bit of, of Gene Crandall and everything's okay, sweetie, kind of moments with the cast? Um, well, they were all pretty terrific, so I didn't need to like comfort them at their mistakes, <laughs> but yeah. I did find myself in the Oscar episode sharing with Laura her, um, you know, to, what it felt like to win the Oscar. And I said, you know, I know this may not apply to your character, but it literally felt when they called my name that I floated up to the stage, <laughs> that I literally was not on feet, that it was almost <laughs> like my big skirt. You know, this is like in when those flowers kind of fly around. Yes. And this little gust of air picked me up the stairs and brought me to the podium. Like, I don't, you know, it, it didn't feel like I made human steps towards it. And that there was this, you know, this wave of love that I felt from the audience that was uh, sort of extraordinary that I didn't expect. Um, and that it was kind of like a dream. Uh, yeah. It had a dreamlike quality. And I don't know if that was helpful to her or not. Um, but it was just, uh, you know, I just thought I would share it with her in case, in case it could be. Yeah. Um, and of course hers was different because she's sort of with the acceptance speech writing a wrong and talking about how important representation is to a, a child like herself when she was growing up to see someone who looked like her, to see yeah. being anything she wanted to be rather than this limited servile role that was given. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, but they, they, they all couldn't have been nicer and kinder and more fun. Like, it was a great, great group of actors, my gosh. And, like, Holland is so extraordinary. There's so much light in Holland's eyes. I just yeah. think she's amazing. And Patty, you know, my dad did a musical with Patty when I was a kid in, called The Baker's Wife in Washington, D.C. Yes. Center. And then she and I did a film, uh, a, you know, Nancy Savoka's film, Union Square, um, in... 2012, I think, I want to say, but um, it's a wonderful indie that no one has seen <laughs> because <laughs> self-released because the, you know, it, it, it was in the Toronto Film Festival and we had a distributor and then the distributor went bankrupt and Nancy oh. and her husband self-released it, but there was no budget. And, you know, um, this was not the time of COVID where everybody's glued to their streaming services and anything is a little bit more de democratic, like, yeah. you know, you can, just watch something because it's the new thing. Yeah. Like when movies are in theaters and before so much streaming, like it was just like, well, you have your two week window. If you don't have big attention thrown at it and people showing up to fill the seats, the movie's gone. Um, so even though we had amazing reviews and you know, some journalists said that I had easily vested my Oscar performance with my performance in Union Square, but no one's seen it. So if you want to have a little fun, <laughs> a little COVID watching, I would say Union Square, if, if you like my character work or my voice work or all that, like this sort of zany, like in between comedy and tragedy, that movie is a good one to watch. Um, but Patty plays my mom in that one. And so it was really cool to get to work with her on this again and kind of compare notes about life and oh, the yeah. business. And, uh, and I just have enormous admiration for her. Um, she is so strong and such a, you know, a, a long-term Kind of winner in this game yeah. and uh, you know not anybody's normal you know she talked about not being sort of the type that people thought was going to succeed but she has succeeded with you know bells on so absolutely well Vera, thank you so much for talking with me today i i hope i hope people check out union square now that you've mentioned it i hope they do uh and, yeah and definitely definitely uh watch hollywood because yeah. i, I I think it's a really wonderful highlight of your career. I mean, I, I do. Oh, thank you so yeah. much. I just rewatched moments yesterday just to kind of, you know, what do I want to talk about? And that just, yeah, th th that moment with, with Holland and Patty around the table was just, it was a spectacular moment for you. And I, I, I hope people watch it and embrace it. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That really means a lot to me. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, I just to be, I, I feel, you know, I feel very um, blessed to, to be sort of given a, a second act, I would say. So, yeah. Well, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right.